All right, so we'll go ahead and start by setting our motivation. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from desire for friends and hatred for enemies. So just let your mind connect with love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. These four immeasurable thoughts. And refuge in bodhicitta. Sange chudon sogi chunam la, janju badu dani gabzoji, dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi, rola penje sange rupanjo, sange chudon sogi chunam la. Jantu Badu Dani Gapsuchi Dagi Chunyan Ki Pe Sonam Ki Rola Penji Sange Drupan Show Sange Churam Sogi Chunam La Jantu Badu Dani Gapsuchi Dagi Chunyan Ki Pe Sonam Ki Rola Penji Sange Drupan Show and letting your mind connect with that refuge, that bodhicitta. Okay. So last time we started at the very beginning of the text of Geshe Chekawa, and we started with the preliminaries, and we don't need to go back through those preliminaries, but it's good to just remember that they exist and that they should inform everything else that we're studying. So just those key points of you have a perfect human rebirth. Don't forget that you have a perfect human rebirth. It's incredibly profound that you have a perfect human rebirth. It's not the way we're used to thinking of our life. We're not used to thinking of our life as perfect. We think of it as all full of troubles internally and externally. And it's very important that we recognize that the suffering and the happiness actually both support our spiritual practice. So then we're also remembering that this is a great life. This is a perfect life for spiritual practice and also is impermanent, is changeable. So we're remembering also that it could end today just like that. And that young people die before old people every day. You know, healthy people die before sick people every day. We have to remember that. We know it intellectually. But because we have this innate grasping at permanence, as well as innate grasping at inherent existence, we just fixate on stability being possible. And have this assumption that the things we see in our friends and family and on the news aren't going to happen to us. It's, it's easy to just kind of be passive about your spiritual practice because it feels like you got plenty of time or you've got other things to do. And to prioritize the spiritual path, you need that remembrance that you have a perfect human life and that it could end at any time. We're, we're just sort of remembering the scene that this falls under the genre of Buddhist literature called Lojong. And Lojong just means thought transformation or mind training. But what are you training it into? What are you training it out of? That becomes the important piece. So all Lojong does emphasize Tonglen, and we're going to talk a bit about Tonglen today, giving and taking practice. All of it emphasizes it, whether implicitly or explicitly. And the point of Tonglen is to develop bodhicitta. Okay, so this is your only real vocab to make sure you get your head around so that you don't get lost with other things. So Lo Zhang is Tibetan for thought transformation, Tonglen, taking and giving, and Bodhicitta is the mind of enlightenment. So 
this mind of enlightenment, most of you know this very well, and I used to drill you on it. So if you don't remember, then oh no, right? But most of you know that bodhicitta is this altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings, right? It's the mind seeking enlightenment. It's the mind seeking to become a Buddha. And you're doing that because that's the best place to be a benefit to others. Nirvana is not enough. And so then it gets described in terms of conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta, but you'll also see it subdivided into aspiring and engaging, and that relates to conventional bodhicitta for the most part. So more on that soon, but here's where we were. The actual practice, training in the awakening mind. The awakening mind is another way of saying bodhicitta. And it gets subdivided into ultimate and conventional. And ultimate comes first in this text, but there's a very strong tradition to swap it because conventional is really what you should practice first as a beginner. Uh, beginners probably shouldn't practice ultimate awakening mind as their first step unless they have very strong imprints or very sharp faculties. <clears throat> okay, so when we talk about these two divisions, method and wisdom, or gathering the two accumulations, just remember what you already know, that the content gets divided into method and wisdom, the two wings that lead us to enlightenment. So method, the practices like loving kindness, compassion, tonglen, etc. Here, relative bodhicitta in general. Wisdom is the practices to realize the emptiness of inherent existence of self and phenomena. Here, in this text, the practice of ultimate or absolute bodhicitta. Okay, so relative bodhicitta is just what you would expect it to be. It's just the bodhicitta that you know. The main Mahayana motivation with two aspirations. To become enlightened for the benefit of all, all sentient beings. These aspirations become a main mind or primary consciousness through study, deep conviction, repetition, and meditations. So why do we want it? Why do we want this mind of enlightenment? Why isn't it enough to just be a good person, trying to get through the day, trying to be ethical, trying to stay out of trouble, you know, just being a good person? Like, what's the point of this big aspiration? And even the big aspiration of I want to become a Buddha is that sort of setting ourselves up for failure? Is that triggering our perfectionist tendencies? Is that problematic in some way even? Like we want to ask these questions and just not go with it and think, oh yeah, bodhicitta, sure, yeah, that's nice. Um, you know, we really want to unpack what is the point of such a grand goal? We really want to ask this question. So the point of such a grand goal, what does it do when you do it right? What does it do when you have the big picture in your mind in everyday life? That's the question. When you're by yourself in your house, just trying to do housework, for example, and say it's housework you don't like doing. Yeah, it's housework you've been putting off. If you're doing it just because you're supposed to or you should or it's building up and it's just for you, it's kind of heavy. But if you have friends and family coming over, you, yes, have social pressure that wants to have a tidy house, but you also have a loving mind that wants it to be a beautiful atmosphere for people. So you might actually do those same chores with a more joyful mind because you're thinking of how to create a nice atmosphere for your loved ones to enter into. So big picture changes the everyday things. When you're doing it right, you know, and if you're doing it for performance or you're doing because you feel like you should or you feel some sort of pressure, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is one of the problems of self-cherishing is that it makes your world small. And when your world is small, everything is annoying, everything's a big deal, things are out of proportion. Yeah, things are out of proportion. And so... It really bothers you when there's a teacup not put away on the right shelf. It really bothers you if your neighbors are using the leaf blower. Like, it gets to you. Yeah? 
But if you're in big picture modality, like if something wonderful has happened in your life or something terrible has happened in your life, but something that made you widen, then those everyday things, you just roll with them. And you're like, oh, that's not where that goes. You move it. Oh, leaf blower. That's unfortunate. Moving on. It doesn't get to you. And so what is a bigger picture than enlightenment? That is the biggest picture you can possibly have. But if you're filtering all of the everyday inconveniences, all the everyday joys and disappointments, all of the everyday stuff into this big picture of how can I use it for fuel for my awakening, then nothing is a problem. Yeah, or you can see the problems in a much different light and have this automatic flexibility that comes with it. So we already have some experience of this, of times when you've been really narrow focused and self-centered or insular, maybe times when you've been really isolated and felt disconnected from the people in your life, then your stuff is carried differently. When you feel connected to sentient beings, that loneliness shifts and you can feel very, very connected even when you're by yourself. And we all know the experience of being surrounded by people we're supposed to relate to and feeling like an alien or feeling disconnected. Yeah, and they're supposed to be our loved ones. So it's not being around the people that makes you feel the connection. It's something to do with how your heart relates. So if you're practicing bodhicitta, you're practicing feeling related. Sometimes it's like most of our life is trying to make connections, keep connections, maintain connections. In Buddhism, it's like you're revealing the fact there has always been connection. Yeah, and then you can just breathe a big sigh of relief and feel completely held by humanity. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of viewing things, and it's something important to experiment with because to have the aspiration of bodhicitta needs to uplift you, it needs to give you buoyancy and enthusiasm, not in a cheesy way, but just in that way that it creates its own kind of momentum where you can weave all of your life into that ideal. So having bodhicitta is a really important thing to understand because it's the point of the whole text is how to develop it. So where we need to start with is, do I like this idea? <laughs> you know, and of course, most of us have had lots of teachings on bodhicitta. And generally, we like this idea very much. But it's good to revisit the simple question. Do I want to be perfect? Do I want to be omniscient? Do I want to be so perfectly, equanimously compassionate? Probably, yeah, that'd be great. But like, give it a minute. Make sure it's true. <laughs> you know, don't just... Take it as an assumption, yeah? And really to think, how would I be different if I didn't have any grudges, if my heart never hardened, if I didn't have these little niggling annoyances, these irritations, what it would be like to just live with my heart open? How relaxed, how happy you'd be, how beneficial you'd be to others, how easy it would be for others to be around you the way all of that would create such a ripple effect in your life. You know, Buddhahood sounds very cosmic, but make it real, make it somehow tangible, just what would be different if it was still you, right? Still your mental continuum, but freed from suffering and freed from negative states of mind. Yeah, and then what about all your good stuff, all of your patience, all of your patience, all of your kindness, all of your kindness, your compassion, all of these qualities, but developed. Not just incidentally here then when you remember them, but like stable. How beautiful it would be. And the mind will do whatever we train it to do. So let's train it to do that and not expect our development and our progress to happen accidentally or incidentally. If we want to evolve, we need to do it on purpose. We're not just going to have a linear progress through reincarnations. We're not going to progress through cyclic existence in this tidy linear way, just getting better and better. Yeah, we can very easily backslide. So this practice has to be intentional. 
And maybe you've already felt it over the years where there've been years where you've really gotten much more mindful, much more steady. And then you plateau for a little bit, but it's fine. And then something happens and you get distracted and there's a big dip and you're just back where you ever were because the habit wasn't strong enough. So it takes a lot of just on purpose, I'm living this way, not passively living this way, not taking it for granted that you're a good person. And so it's good enough. Not taking it for granted that you want to be motivated in big ways, but consciously making sure that you are. Because this is how you create the habit energy that sticks. Conventional bodhicitta is um, what the mind training verses we're looking at today are about. But later we're going to look at the mind training verses about ultimate bodhicitta, which is exactly the same thing, except it's in the mind of someone who has realized emptiness directly or perceptually. So ultimate bodhicitta is still bodhicitta, the main Mahayana motivation with two aspirations to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings but it's in the mind of someone who actually understands reality fully, at least while they're in, in meditative equipoise. Okay. So last time we did banish the one to blame for everything and meditate on the great kindness of all beings, right? And this is sort of your general bodhicitta overcoming self-cherishing, you know, adage. And then we get into Tonglen, practice a combination of giving and taking. Giving and taking should be practiced alternately, and you should begin by taking from yourself. These two should be made to ride on the breath. So before we move on, the banish the one to blame for everything, you, how do you relate to that now that you've had a week to let it sort of digest? What is the one to blame for everything? Your mother-in-law. Correct. <laughs> no. Who is the one to blame for everything? Not you. You're not the one to blame for everything. <laughs> Tiana's contribution, self-cherishing. Exactly, exactly. Self-cherishing, self-cherishing. So we got to know it. We have to know it. So self-cherishing is not the self, not at all. It, we have to feel it out experientially. You know, it's the one that gets the feeling of being the hero or the villain, or the victim. It's the one that feels hated, or celebrated, or ignored. It's the one that keeps setting up the target to be hit. Yeah, it's that part of you that, like, gets offended. <laughs> that. That is not you. That is a symptom of self-cherishing and self-grasping. Yeah. Think of yourself when you're just, you know, very relaxed, very happy, when you feel really safe and connected to the people around you. Someone can do something rude and and you just respond in really skillful ways or you laugh it off or it doesn't get to you. But if you're in a bad mood, it's like you've taken a hit. You've been wounded and now you have to go like lick your wound, you know, and sort of comfort yourself with all of the reasons why they're bad, all of the reasons why you're misunderstood, all of the reasons why people are unreliable and horrible, and you sort of have to soothe yourself. But who are you soothing? Yeah. So when you're saying banish the one to blame for everything, you could just say selfishness. Yeah. Selfishness is the one to blame for everything. But we're talking about a specific type of selfishness that is much more subtle and much more insidious than what we would normally call selfishness colloquially. This very subtle self-cherishing thought operates all the time for us at our level. And it's the one that makes you feel like the main character in the story. Yeah, you're the main character in the story. And there's always a, narr a narration going on, whether verbally or not, just kind of like, and now the hero goes to the grocery store, <laughs> and now the hero gets in the car. You're not saying that to yourself, but it's it's like you have this spotlight on yourself. And it can actually be a terrible suffering because you feel self-conscious. You know, you really feel like people are looking at you. You feel like people are judging you. 
sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But self-cherishing assumes everyone's looking at you. And then you either get kind of arrogant and proud and haughty and sort of blustery and trying to like, you know, prove something. Or you get kind of cringy and defeated and small and hope no one notices you. But they're both symptoms of self-cherishing. And what it does is it means you're oblivious to others. You're oblivious. You're not like going out wanting to hurt people. You're not planning attacks. You're not a bad person. But you're oblivious to your impact on other people. Yeah, there's an indifference there. And that indifference reinforces that feeling of separateness that we feel. Yeah, or that feeling of disconnect we can have with people. So it's, it's really important to just almost step outside of yourself and like look at the landscape view. You know, you in proportion to all other sentient beings might be too much, but you in proportion to all other sentient beings in the room, <laughs> right? Or you and all other sentient beings in the general vicinity, right? And as if you're sort of like looking from the outside in and saying, oh yeah, there's me there and there's someone else there and someone else there and look, oh, they are all someone's, hmm, <laughs> right? Seems so obvious. I know it seems obvious, but we have to remember that when we centralize ourselves, we have a exaggerated proportion of interest in that self. It's too much. It's too much. And it actually makes us feel worse. When you're thinking of others, it benefits you. When you're thinking of you, it harms you. And that doesn't mean regular self-care isn't a priority. Of course it is. But it's from a completely different perspective. You say, I must sleep enough. I must eat healthy. I must move my body sometimes because I need to be strong to be of benefit to sentient beings. And it's actually an act of self-cherishing to say, oh, it's just me and my body so I can eat crap. It doesn't hurt, hurt anyone but me. I can chain smoke, it doesn't hurt anyone but me, but it hurts how much you're able to benefit others. It hurts how much you're able to benefit others. It's sort of like saying there's a, say a communally used car that the whole family uses and you never fill up the tank because you don't need it that day. Yeah, but the rest of the family might need to use the car, right? So it's like, you're the car, right? You've got to keep the tank full if when you're thinking, well, it only harms me, you're forgetting your impact on other people. And so what's so interesting with self-cherishing is that it, it exaggerates both directions. It minimizes your impact on others, or it maximizes your impact on others. It exaggerates one of two ways. It thinks no one, no one notices me, cares, or, in, or is influenced at all. Or everyone is influenced and cares about me a great deal, and I have an ego to maintain. You know, it's it's fascinating, yeah? So what we're trying to do is just keep widening, keep expanding, keep stretching the vision outward. And in that way, you see yourself in the correct proportion. So self-cherishing is like a prison. And in order to overcome it, we use the strategy of Tonglen. But before we even do that, we have to say... This is the one to blame for everything. Yeah. It is this attitude that is to blame for everything. And if you can, start with blaming your own self-cherishing for your own suffering. But if that's too much, too fast, say you have a very difficult person in your life, someone who is challenging you regularly, if you can say the one to blame for everything is not them, but their self-cherishing. It's their self-cherishing attitude that is driving their negative behavior. It is not them. It's not their good heart. It's not their Buddha nature. It is their self-cherishing. And because of their self-cherishing, they create a whole tornado of suffering for themselves. And you just got swept up in that tornado. Yeah. But they hate being in there just as much as you do. Yeah. It's... It's difficult when you have someone who seems to delight in the misfortunes of others or is oblivious to their impact on others. But if you can really step back from it and see the whole scene, 
you have to think the one to blame for all of this is self-cherishing. How does that sit though? Do you feel resistances or, or questions or insights coming up? Is the one to blame for everything self-cherishing? Yes. Did you hand that session? Yeah, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> What's the difference between self-cherishing and ego then? Ego usually refers to self-grasping. Yeah. So self-grasping is related to this innate ignorance and the innate ignorance that views this self, the relative self in your own mental continuum, but holds it to exist inherently. So the ego grasping or the self-grasping is what gives you this illusion of separateness then self-cherishing comes along and says, well, I better protect it then. Yeah, I better protect and defend and gather resources and get away harmers, forgetting that the whole premise is flawed. You have an illusion of separateness that has never been the case. The reality has always been like infinite interconnection. Yeah, but self-grasping makes you feel like you are a rock, you are an island, and you get Simon and Garfunkel stuck in your head, right? You're like, you're all alone, <laughs> right? So that feeling of I am an island, that is self-grasping. And then self-cherishing is, well, I better protect the island and put barbed wire here and try and get resources there and hoard and be miserly and you know, gatekeep and all of that stuff, all of which makes me feel like even more of an island when in fact you never were one to begin with. Yeah, so self-cherishing and self-grasping, they're called the twin demons that lie at the heart of all sentient beings, but they're removable and we have to keep remembering that. They're not intrinsic to the nature of your mind. The nature of your mind is clarity and awareness. It has Buddha nature, it always has. And it has always had innate ignorance, which has fed the self-cherishing. You can't get rid of your Buddha nature. So that's good news. What is your Buddha nature? It's the fact that your mind lacks inherent existence. So it can transform. It can completely and fundamentally transform into perfection. So... When you're sitting with these ideas, you know, really let it be beautiful, let it be esoteric, let it be playful, but then bring it down and pull it right into your immediate life and think, who do I not like? <laughs> who am I attached to and clingy about? When do I get needy? When do I get aggressive? When do I vague out and space out and disassociate? How is the everyday experience? actually very much related to self-cherishing fed by self-grasping and then vicious circle yeah you have to make it immediate so you know you wake up in the morning and you think oh i don't want to get out of bed what is it that doesn't want to get out of bed who is it that doesn't want to get out of bed why is it you know like ask deeper questions rather than just say get on with it just do it or no i'm not going to an indulgence you know, we're so quick to just react that we don't ask the question of, I wonder why, though. Why is it I don't want to get up? Yeah, who is it that doesn't want to get up? What do I think is going to happen once I get up? Let's unpack it while staying all snuggly and cozy. <laughs> right? but, you know, like ask the deep questions rather than just kind of lurch from choice to choice because that's what you're supposed to do. So banish the blame, one to blame for everything. And meditate on the kindness of all beings. Yes, even the baddies, because the baddies are helping show you yourself and where your love and compassion might be conditional. Okay, so this is from um, uh, the Geshe Zopa commentary. He says, because we have not known what to blame, We've always held others or our circumstances responsible for the suffering we experience. We have failed to understand that, in fact, other living beings, our old and very kind mothers, are like wish-fulfilling jewels that grant us everything we desire. Instead, we have considered them our enemy and source of harm. We constantly cast around for something to blame for our failures, 
our pain and disappointments. We see our selfishness not as an enemy, but as an ally helping us get what we want and willingly allow it to govern us. The true culprit that harms us is right here. So once we recognize the truth of this, we should remind ourselves of it frequently by repeating, put all the blames in one place or banish the one to blame for everything over and over again. And slowly it will make an impact. Does that sit well with everybody or do you feel some? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a very powerful one. And I guess the, the questions that can arise or could arise are what about someone who is harming others? What do you do about that? What about someone, you know, what about when you're with someone who is actively doing things that you find very harmful to yourself? How do you manage banish the one to blame for everything when actually they could just cut it out and life would be better? What do you do in that case, right? Yeah. You know? Like, I don't know, say you've got like a really, really critical spouse and nothing is ever right. And they're always nagging at you and saying, why are you doing it this way? Do it that way again and again. And you're doing the best you can, but you know, this is, this is as good as it gets. And you wish they'd just lay off. Yeah. Just lay off me. And so much of your life would improve if they were just a bit more patient and a bit more accepting and let you be. Can you picture a situation like that? Yeah. And is the one to blame for everything self-cherishing? Yeah. And is it okay to say, could you give me a break? Yeah. Both things can be true. Both things can be true. But when self-cherishing is driving, it gets a type of insistence and a type of urgency. It gets mm -hmm. an aggression to it that says, you have to or else. Yeah, or else I'm out of here. Or if you don't, I'm just going to collapse into a heap of depression and despair and feel like a doormat. I'm going to implode or I'm going to explode. And those are my only two choices. When self-cherishing is up, that's what it feels like. When self-cherishing is settled, you say, is it a valid need? Is it a valid thing in terms of worldly experience to ask my spouse to give me a break and to stop nagging? And you kind of step back from it and you say, yeah, I think it's a fair ask, but I can't assume they'll take it well. So how about I just go in with a curious, collaborative mind that's ready for them to say, no, bugger off, <laughs> right? You know, so you're going in with flexibility. You're going in with a sense of collaboration. Already the chances are better that communication will go well. And if it doesn't, it doesn't have the same power to destroy your peace. Mm. Could, could that yeah. be related to having attachment to a particular outcome if you're if you're still in self-cherishing you're wanting it to come out a certain way rather than just stating your truth and yeah. then and then just trying to be present with it in an open-hearted way exactly yeah exactly right. exactly so you know if you're sifting through things in your life that are you know getting under your skin there's really only a few that are deal breakers that mean if this doesn't change, I'm going to need to not be in connection with this person. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are a few things where it's high stakes. You know, if you don't stop gambling away all of our money, we're going to be poor and destitute. And so I'm going to give you some time to get your act together. But if you don't, I'm going to have to leave you because I've got to eat. Mm. You know, right. There, there are a few things that are high stakes. But so much of our life, we make high stakes when it's really not. And there's so few things more important than harmony. And it's tricky because if you're always the one doing the mind training and they seem to never work on themselves even a little, is that fair? What is fair to ask of another person? You know, these are complicated questions. Mm. And so... So we take these beautiful ideas and we take them to heart and we live them the best we can, but then we smack up against the complications of life. And 
when you smack up against the complications of life, that brings richness to the practice. But what it can do is make you confused and talk over the top of your experience trying to get to the right answer from the mind training tradition. Right? And so this is what we call spiritual bypassing, right? Where you jump over your experience to the conclusion. You know, like if someone is diagnosed with an illness and they tell you about it and you say, oh, well, you know, it's your karma. <laughs> not helpful, right? That's not a helpful thing to say. Is it true that it's their karma? Yes. And also, let's not start with that. Let's start with compassion, please. You know, mm -hmm. and also, is karma equated to fault? No, but that was in your tone. So cut it out, you know all of these things. So so what we need to do with with all of this is to really sit with what is a pace that I can sustain? And what are ways I can be really boldly honest about where my capacity is not there yet? You know, so you say, I would like to be able to accommodate any number of rude behaviors from sentient beings and for it to not destroy my peace. But actually, there are a couple of things that I'm not quite flexible enough yet. So I might have to express a preference. Yeah, I might have to say to the person in the movie theater, could you stop talking? You could mind train yourself through the whole movie with the person talking behind you and be, it's the one to blame for everything is why I'm so annoyed. I think that my silence is more important than their conversation. You could go a whole story of your thought transformation. And that might be very useful. And also it might be useful to just turn around and be like, could you not? <laughs> could you just not? <laughs> you know, so so don't use mind training in absence or in separation from your common sense. Have your common sense and your lojong be best friends and collaborate with each other. Mm. So your common sense gets healthier and deeper and broader, but still carries with it practical things, everyday things that you've known the whole time before you ever met philosophy. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Well, it, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just thinking it, the um, point at which it goes into self-pity is interesting. Mm. Yeah. Know, so, like yeah, so. that person in the theater seemed to me to touching onto self-pity really for me. Yeah. Saddle with this. Yep, because suddenly you've become the main character again. Oh. Yeah, you're the, you're the poor victim. <laughs> yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's. However, you can get there, but it does really help to get that bird's eye view of yourself in relation to others. Yeah, just like you you remember when um you know you first heard about the moon landing. And the way Lance Armstrong said, when he looked back at the earth, the way everything was in perspective, and it really changed his whole outlook. Mm. You know, it's really powerful to think about yourself in connection, in relation to other sentient beings from an outside perspective like that, because you see the way that you're important is different. It's not that you're not important but you're not important in the way self-cherishing thinks you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're important from a place of, you're someone who has the chance to develop your mind and be of benefit to others because you've met teachings that encourage that at a time when your mind was open to it. And that seems very easy and nice and natural, but it's actually not that common. And so you think, well, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? I have to be the one that works to transform my mind and brings peace to situations. You know, so you're thinking of yourself, I am important, but I'm only important because of all these different conditions that are unrelated to me that just came together here at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just, you know, gently, gently. Okay, so one of the best ways to get your bodhicitta activated is to do tonglen. So you practice a combination of giving and taking. Giving and taking should be practiced alternately. You should begin by taking from yourself. 
these two should be made to ride on the breath. So the first one was kind of just describing mind training in general, the way to develop bodhicitta and overcome self-cherishing. This one is very specific and pointed. So um, Geshe Jumpa Techok says, exchanging self and others means switching these two so that instead of being primarily concerned about our own happiness, we become more concerned for that of others. And instead of neglecting others, we neglect ourselves and strive for enlightenment for their benefit. So that's tricky, right? Neglect ourselves. You don't want to neglect yourself. That doesn't want, it's, it's not what it sounds like. It's not what it sounds like. It's neglect that kind of obsessive, fiddly, constant monitoring of, am I okay enough? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, you want to be fed and watered. Very important. You want to be well slept, right? Very important. You want to move your, your limbs a little bit. So, you know, keep it all working. But more than that doesn't need to be so specific. And sometimes we have dietary restrictions and sometimes we have medications and sometimes blah, blah, blah. That's fine. But we get so nitpicky about what we need in order to feel content and happy and correct in our body and correct and happy in our mind. We're forever in too much, not enough, too much, not enough. Yeah. And so to neglect the self means to neglect that obsessive self that just won't stop fidgeting. Yeah, whether we're literally fidgeting physically or just mentally, we're just hunting for entertainment. It's like, actually, let it go. It'll never be balanced perfectly for more than a few minutes anyway. And actually, if you think about others, your own little niggly needs relax themselves naturally. Yeah. So... To neglect ourselves doesn't mean literally to neglect ourselves. It's to neglect that kind of obsessive way. And so there's a connection between self-cherishing mind and self-grasping or grasping at true existence. The self-grasping mind is the actual root or fundamental cause of all samsaric suffering, but is very closely followed by the self-cherishing mind, which arises on the basis of self-grasping and itself serves as the basis for all other delusions. So then Venerable Pema Chudran, who we know and love, she says, although there are many ways we can approach Tonglen, the essence of the practice is always the same. Yeah, so whatever variation you come across, remember the essence is the same. We breathe in what is painful and unwanted with a sincere wish that we and others could be free of suffering. As we do so, we drop the storyline that goes along with the pain and feel the underlying energy. And we completely open our hearts and minds to whatever arises. And then exhaling, we send out relief from the pain with the intention that we and others be happy. When we are willing to stay even for a moment with uncomfortable energy, we gradually learn not to fear it. Then when we see someone in distress, we're not reluctant to breathe in the person's suffering and send out relief. Okay, so it's really just in-breath compassion, out-breath love. In-breath compassion, out-breath love. Compassion is may they be free of their suffering, so you're taking in their suffering. Love, may they have happiness, you're sending out happiness. It's a mental attitude. And it can ride on the breath with or without visualization. You can bring in visualization if you like. But start simple if you're new to it, or start simple if you're rusty, you know, if you haven't done it in a while. And just really think what happens to your heart if you do the opposite of what self-cherishing wants. Self-cherishing says, I must protect myself from all discomfort and inconvenience at all costs. <laughs> right? Discomfort and inconvenience must be avoided. That is the mission of my life. And sometimes to sprinkle in entertainment and then die. Yeah, that's kind of the mission of self-cherishing. And it's, it's a bit poignant, right? But lots of people do it. And we are lots of people, right? So it's, it's important to just sit with, what if I did the opposite? What's the worst that could happen, right? 
you'd be a little bit more uncomfortable for a minute. Oh, well. But what's the best that could happen? You might actually develop your resilience to the point where you can cope with more easier. Yeah, you can cope with more easier because you're building this attitude of cherishing others the way you would build muscle mass. By adding a little resistance and a little discomfort, you increase your ability to deal with discomfort. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to play with it. But if you try it with something very simple and it says it should start with yourself, if, before we even do a meditation, just sit with what is a little bit uncomfortable in my body. Just a little uncomfortable, because I'm guessing every single person in this class has something a little uncomfortable in their body right now. Yeah, do you have a foot that's asleep? Do you have a back that's out? Do you have a headache? Do you have an itch? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing there's no one that doesn't have a little something. Yeah, so pick a little something in your body, all right? Searching, searching. It doesn't have to be all of them at once. Just pick one. So mentally scan through the body what is a bit uncomfortable. Um, okay, my right ankle hurts. I twisted it earlier. Okay, that's the one. Now, what do you do, right? You, instead of ignoring the pain or obsessing about the pain, you don't go either direction. You think, how about I voluntarily take it on? How about I say, this is just what I wanted. Thanks. I'm going to give it to self-cherishing. I'm going to give that very distress to the thing that caused the distress. It came from the self-cherishing thought. I'm giving it back to the self-cherishing thought. How did my hurt ankle come from the self-cherishing thought? Was I, was I obsessing about myself when I stumbled on the way to the car? No, not particularly more than usual. But pain is negative karma ripening. Negative karma comes from harmful actions in the past. Why do you do harmful actions? Because of self-cherishing and self-grasping, right? You see yourself as separate, then you do flawed strategies to protect it, and you hurt each other, which plants a seed on your mental continuum that just hangs out there. And then it meets with conditions like slippery grass and <laughs> ripens as suffering. So yes, my ankle pain did come from self-cherishing. That's where it came from. Yes, it also came from the slippery grass. But really, the condition was not the main thing. If I hadn't created the cause, that slippery grass wouldn't have the same effect. Yeah, I might have slipped and it not hurt. I might not have slipped at all, right? It was not the grass's fault or the person who's supposed to mow its fault. It's the fault of my self-cherishing. So... That's an interesting way of looking at it, even if it was someone's job to trim the grass. That can also still be true, but it's not the point anymore. The self-cherishing mind says it's the whole point. Someone was supposed to mow the grass, otherwise it wouldn't slip. Yeah, that's what self-cherishing does. It makes, it makes a whole villain. Who's the villain is the self-cherishing, your own. So you think I'm breathing in that pain, and I'm breathing it in, maybe it takes the form of black smoke, and I give it to the self-cherishing attitude, which lives at my heart center, but is not my good heart. Think of your good, kind heart at your heart center, like warm golden light, but then self-cherishing has created a false shell that thinks it's protecting it, but it's actually blocking it. Yeah. It feels like protection, but it's actually blocking you. It's actually separating you. It's cutting you off from the herd, and now you feel all alone. So you breathe it in, and you imagine that then it either softens and weakens that shell, or that perhaps a storm cloud forms and lightning strikes and cracks that shell. But either way, the shell becomes weakened by the pain that you take on voluntarily. And then your good heart is released and you send out happiness and all of the comfort. So you can think, okay, what's comfortable in my body? You know, what's not causing trouble? And you're like, well, everything's causing a little bit of trouble. And you're like, no, no, my right elbow feels fine. <laughs> my right elbow feels fine. Also, my ears are fine today. Also, and you're like, actually, no, there's some good spots. There's some spots in the body not causing trouble. 
all right, I'm not going to hang on to those and cling to those and be attached to those. The happiness in my body right now came from sentient beings. And you're like, really? What? No, it didn't. Came from a good night's sleep and eating properly. No. <laughs> right? The happiness in your body came from sentient beings because it's positive karma ripening. Positive karma was created in dependence upon interaction. Positive interaction with sentient beings planted a positive karmic seed, and then it met with the conditions of sleeping well and eating okay. And now you have happiness. So you think happiness came from sentient beings? I'm going to give it back to sentient beings. Yeah, suffering came from self-cherishing, give it back to self-cherishing. Happiness came from sentient beings, give it back to sentient beings. Did I lose anybody? It's, it's radical, right? It's radical. And if you do it too literally without unpacking the why, you can get a bit, you know, confused. But if you really think about karma, it starts to feel only right. It starts to feel only right to give suffering back to self-cherishing. feels only right to give happiness back to sentient beings. Yeah, not just a good idea, but correct. So it's, it's something really unique about this particular strategy of Tonglen. And, um, you know, I think that when we do it, we should really make sure that we're keeping a curious mind, a playful mind, but letting it really strike the heart of that thing that feels like protection. Because it's not protection. And when you do that, you know, it's counterintuitive, but it's not going to hurt you to try just gently experimentally and so you do that for yourself and then you start doing that for others and you think who in my life is struggling who's got dodgy finances who's got relationship breakdowns who's got a scary diagnosis who is falling apart mentally I want all of their suffering too not just my own I want it give it to me I'm going to give it to the self-cherishing thought and all of my happiness my current happiness, all my resources, all my friends, all my family, all my cute cats, right? All of the groceries in my fridge, all of the beautiful views out my windows, everything. I'm giving it to sentient beings. Yeah, psychologically. And this creates a really interesting thing when you're not in meditation. Yeah, when you're not in meditation and then you meet someone who's struggling, your first response isn't, resistance or fixing it your first response is a calm that's not reactive yeah and if you can meet other people's suffering without being reactive then you can do your absolute best for them your best might not be enough that's okay life's complicated but you can't do your best if you're agitated yeah, if you're agitated with, oh, this is uncomfortable, I don't really know what to do here, or oh, that's gross, I don't want to look at it, or whatever the case may be, your resistance clouds your clarity. So how can you bring your best when you're all clouded? So when you're doing Tonglen practice for others, be as radical as you can, yeah, and really think all of the suffering, all the floods, all the famines, everything, everything, but do it gradually. And just kind of see what happens, because it can really change how you live your life. So we'll take a little break, and then we'll do the meditation. So get yourself into a posture for meditation. Nice straight back. <clears throat> If you're in a chair, if you can scooch a little bit so that you're not relying too much on the back. And just take a minute and balance yourself so that it feels easy to sit up and down. Feels easy in your shoulders, in your back. And just do what you need to do to find that center balance so being straight upright feels easy
And for a few moments, just focus on the breath or a different object of single pointedness that feels comfortable, like the sensation of your feet. But just choose one simple focus and use that to allow surface distractions to settle. The breath or something else used single pointedly. And whenever you get distracted, just consciously disengage and come back to the breath or whatever your object is. Just keep it simple, clear, bright focus, nothing to anticipate. And as the mind starts to settle, revive your motivation from the beginning of class. Whatever words strike you, something altruistic. And then with that motivation, allow yourself to list the difficulties in your life right now without falling into self-pity or falling into the story. Write them like a laundry list, like a to-do list, like a list on your refrigerator. Just name what's hard with your body, what's difficult with your mind, what's going on in your relationships that is problematic, anything that you find difficult, let yourself name them to yourself. Unedited.
things that are a big deal, things that are a little aggravating, everything in between, just allow yourself to list it. Here are the things I don't want to be happening. Let yourself articulate those. Sort of hold that list to one side and remind yourself of some things about that. Remind yourself that resistance to all these difficulties doesn't make it better. That reacting and resisting and pushing them away or building a whole story about them collapses your creativity, makes you too agitated to problem solve. And what's more, the more you identify with your problems, the harder it is sometimes to notice the way others are suffering. And so imagine instead of resisting, you voluntarily take on all these troubles and you give them to the self-cherishing attitude, which is like that hard shell covering your good kind heart. This pain and suffering and difficulty came from the self-cherishing thought Give it back to the self-cherishing thought. And so focus just on the in-breath for a while. Imagine breathing in the list. Making it voluntary. Seeing it as fuel for practice. Seeing it as useful. Using it to weaken self-cherishing. Breathe in the list of all your troubles. Give it to the self-cherishing attitude, weakening it. Really feel as you breathe in that your resistance is lessening, your reactivity is softening, agitation settling. Instead of these being things you don't want, deciding they're things that are useful.
And now switch and think about the good in your life. Think about what's going well, the health that is in your body, the strength that's still there, the ways that your mind can be sharp, can be insightful, can be kind. Think about the good in your resources, things you like about your home, your relationships. And again, just list those, not overly identifying. Just name what's going well. And as you name those good things in your life, let yourself feel the various forms of attachment and clinging you might have to them. Feelings of possessiveness or miserliness, deprivation mentalities that might not want to share. and tell yourself them some things about this happiness. Tell yourself about how all of this happiness is positive karma ripening that came through interaction with sentient beings. And even the resources themselves are related to sentient beings. So many sentient beings are a component of the happiness you experience now. Even those you've never met, like whoever built your house or the roads near you. Those who harvest the crops, etc. And so even as you feel that miserliness or that possessiveness about your happiness, allow yourself to recognize ownership is an exaggeration. Possessiveness is coming from a place of affliction. That of course a person needs a certain amount of resources but that clinging actually doesn't help you keep anything. And so see if you can imagine voluntarily giving these things away, sending your health, sending your insights, sending your resources, your relationships, your environment. Send them out. Release them back to sentient beings. They came from sentient beings. Give them back to sentient beings. And let that attitude ride on your out-breath sending on the out-breath.
And as you send out that happiness, maybe it takes the form of golden light. And imagine that that happiness, all of those resources, those supports, that all of them were trapped and suffocated behind the self-cherishing. And now they're released. And even as they're released, they fill you even more completely than before. You're not hoarding them anymore. They're able to breathe and flow. And that golden light can ex exit through the pores of your body and especially out through the breath, going towards all sentient beings, sharing, collaborating, giving. And so now moving on, just allow the idea of giving and taking to settle simply on the flow of your breath, both directions. And so in breath, compassion, taking suffering, out breath, love, giving happiness. Come to its simplest form letting it flow with the breath. In-breath, compassion. Out-breath, love. In-breath, taking suffering. Out-breath, giving happiness. And spend a minute just getting that simple flow going with both directions of your breath. And with in-breath compassion and out-breath love, let your mind get more specific, taking on the suffering of friends and family, sending all of your current and future happiness to them. And so get more specific about individuals or groups. Take on suffering, give over happiness. individuals or groups that you know and can relate to.
and expand to now include people you don't know and groups you don't necessarily relate to. But expand that, taking on suffering, giving over happiness, in-breath compassion, out-breath love, for people everywhere. You can think of places in particular strife. Maybe those suffering in the Middle East or in Ukraine. Or you can think of general groups you know struggle. People without homes. People suffering from severe mental health issues. Just let your mind move around to the sufferings of humanity and take them on to your self-cherishing attitude and give them all of your happiness, present and future, warm, radiant, golden light. And now include other sentient beings besides humans, animals, and beings that are unseen. See if you can include the suffering of all sentient beings of all six realms, taking on all of that on the in-breath, giving it to the self-cherishing. Sending all of the happiness, present and future, to all realms. Imagine with a few more breaths that self-cherishing has been completely weakened such that it collapses and that your heart of cherishing others blossoms into full bodhicitta. Filling your whole body, your whole mind, radiating out.
And then gradually allow your analysis to relax and your focus on the breath to relax and release. And imagine you're holding that attitude of bodhicitta as the essence of the meditation, able to carry it with you off of the cushion. We dedicate John Chus and Jorin Boshe, Mage Panam Kegyochi, Ke Pan Yamba Me Payam, Kone Gondu Pawan Shom. Okay, relax your attention. And so see if you can do that before our next session, sometime by yourself, even just the simplest version, even just in-breath compassion, out-breath love, and then a layer in as much elaboration as you can hold without getting tight. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Now, um, I just want to show you how many cool resources there are for this text. Um, so Start Where You Are by Be Venerable Pema Chodron is actually on this text. And it's really good for those of you that are not familiar with Buddhist terminology. Then the one by B. Allen Wallace is great for those who enjoy a technical presentation. And then Mind Training Like the Rays of the Sun, is the one that I started with, and it has a nice long rim outline way of framing it together with the commentary by Num Capel. Now these, the two on the ends are newer. These are contemporary compilations of lots of Lojong texts. So I really recommend those two if you're interested, but for just a classic Geshe style presentation, we have the one by Geshe Sonam Rinchen there in the middle. But wait, there's more. So the ones you guys have um, included in your course materials is The Kindness of Others by Geshe Jampa Techok. And it's brilliant. It's really experiential as well as technical when it needs to be. And similar to that one are the ones by Gomo Choku and Chogim Trumpa. Okay. <laughs>